Podcasting from the Space Coast in Florida, this is the Dadpreneur Podcast, where we'll feature entrepreneurs, share digital marketing strategies to help grow your business, and discuss the dynamics of family and business. Now your host, Alex Oliveira. Welcome to the Dadpreneur Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Oliveira, and I am delighted to be interviewing Matt Wiggler of the Wiggler Group. Welcome, Matt. Thanks, Alex. Great to see you. Awesome. So Matt and I, we've been talking for a little bit of probably I'd say about a month now on and off uh, just business. Right. And I was diving deep into his his business and how it pivoted during COVID, which we're going to get to to that later on this episode. But I first really wanted to give you the opportunity, Matt, to tell us how you became an entrepreneur. You have such a an interesting background and music and jazz. I love jazz. So I want to definitely talk about that as well. Sure. Uh, so tell us about you, Matt. Sure. So uh, originally I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, I came down here to Miami to uh, originally to go to music school at the Frost School of Music at University of Miami, which is a really great uh, music school. And, uh, you know, I was studying jazz piano and had started playing uh, jazz and blues piano professionally at a very young age uh, when I was in high school in, in Maryland. So I came down here. I ended up uh, getting a uh, double major from University of Miami, music and Spanish language, um, and kind of fell in love with Miami and decided to uh, stay and then uh, got my MBA also at University of Miami. Um, and I started my uh, first business, which is about five years old now, called MHW Live Music. Um, we provide live music entertainment for hotels all around the country. So uh, we're managing, you know, entertainment programs where if you imagine a luxury hotel, they'll have a whole series of uh, different musicians in the lobby or a DJ at the pool or, you know, uh, that, that sort of program at, at big resorts. And we do it nationwide. Um, so that business um, you know, was rolling along great. And then COVID hit and all the hotels shut down. Sure. Um, and so basically what I did was, uh, we had developed a really efficient business to business, uh, sales and marketing process to get our, to get that service into the hotels. Mm -hmm. And I had some good people in place. And so basically, uh, last year in June, I decided to take that process that we have and spin it off into a second business, which is Wiggly Group that we'll talk about. But basically, um, the hypothesis was lots and lots of companies of all sizes, but especially smaller and medium sized companies, um, you know, don't necessarily have a fully baked sales and marketing process, especially for high ticket B2B. How do we go out and get a consistent pipeline of opportunities? So it turns out that hypothesis was correct. And we're providing this service, which we'll talk about for lots of clients on that business. And now I'm very happy to report that the live music business is back better than ever with the reopening uh, over the past, you know, six to nine months, it's been growing very quickly. So that, uh, that basically, you know, brings us to present day. Right. And it's one of those things where I think all of us in business, no matter how small or big your company is during COVID, went through these pivots and through these survival mode. Do I change yep. my product offering, go online? I have clients with a, with similar stories like that, where they created a new pipeline as a way of surviving and then yep. discovered now that their business is back and rolling that it's actually a sustainable business model. So it's just, there's a lot of obviously pain to talk about during COVID for everyone, but sure. there, are, there are definitely some um, great stories too. And I think yours is, is definitely one of those. So talk to me a little bit about you, the, the side of, of Matt that is more the musician. Like how does that, how has that helped you as an entrepreneur? Because I, I can think of a lot of metaphors and analogies. Yeah, sure 
on the creative side and yep. especially jazz being that everything happens so quickly. Right. So talk to me about how you use those um, sort of superpowers to help you in your business life. Yeah, that, that's a great question. That, this is something that I, I think is, uh, there's so many parallels to talk about between music and especially jazz and leadership and business in general and uh, maybe especially entrepreneurship. Um, one of the interesting things that, I mean, I'll start with what I think is interesting uh, when I talk to uh, people who are full-time musicians, you know, that, that are just 100% uh, out, you know, playing, playing music. Um, I think what lots of musicians realize this, but I would say not all of them realize that all of them are entrepreneurs, right? If you're self-employed, you're out looking for gigs, you're out creating your website, you're marketing material, you're, you know, people are releasing albums, you know, all those people are entrepreneurs. And the ones that are very successful are the ones that treat it like, this is my business, even if my business is marketing myself and, uh, you know, go through the same process that you and I and all of us that start businesses understand how to do the different elements. How do I do my marketing, my messaging, my client experience and how I communicate and all of this stuff. So that's something that I always like to talk about with the, with the people that are musicians. But what, what I find for me is very interesting parallels um, between let's say leading a jazz band, if I'm going to go out and play a concert with my band, usually I play with a trio or a quartet. What are the parallels between that and running a business? I think a lot of people don't realize that there's a lot of stuff in common between these things. I mean, one of the things that I like to talk about as far as, you know, as kind of a leadership construct is at least my approach to this is, I want to go out, let's talk about if I'm going to put together a band. I want to go out and put together the absolute best band possible, which means putting the best person I can find in the right role in the band. So, you know, there's these defined roles. There's a bass player, there's a drummer, there's a guitar player, who's doing what? And it's a combination of not only do they have to be very good and skilled individually, but there has to be an alignment of what are we trying to accomplish? What do we want the band to sound like? Who's going to do what so that we don't step on each other's toes, right? Put that whole thing together. And what, the thing that I see that I really enjoy about being the leader of a band is if I don't even have to play and the band sounds great. Imagine I put together these people, everybody's playing their part. It sounds so great. And if I just sit back and wow, this thing is really, it's really rolling along. It's sounding great. Well, obviously everything I just said, if you change band to business, it's the same thing, right? You want to yeah. put together your management or leadership team and get the right people sitting in the right seats and empower them and inspire them to take on leadership of, of you know, what it is that they're responsible for. And then if you've done that correctly, just like in, leading the band, if you're leading the business, you don't have to be in there doing everything yourself. You can watch the, uh, you know, watch the sort of machine run, hopefully as smoothly as possible, um, you know, by sort of engendering that leadership in your team. So I see those things as being totally analogous. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm realizing that more and more as the businesses are growing and we're hiring more people and uh, so it's very cool to see to see that. Yeah. I, and I, while I'm not a musician or I play no instruments, I've always taken either sports or music, being a fan of both and, and, and try to draw comparisons, right? Or analogies. Yep. And, and I think with, for me with music, what I tell my friends who are musicians or pursuing art, art in general, is that the biggest thing that you have to have that aligns with entrepreneurship and you're going to be that solopreneur is that you have to take risks like you have to all the time and failure is just part of the the, the journey right sure and, and you reflect on it and then you tweak it optimize it and keep going but you can't keep looking in the rear view mirror and the second thing that to me i've always have found it really difficult and i talk to a lot of entrepreneurs who feel the same map is 
staying focused and being consistent. Those two yeah. things, right? I mean, they, they are one and the same, but when yeah. I watch some of my friends play their guitar or whatever instrument yeah. they're playing, how consistent they have to be mm -hmm. and focus to be able to get that perfect note. I, I see that. And I'm like, I can't do that with music, of course, but I do that in business. And when I yeah. do that, that's when I have the best outcomes. When yeah. I uh, allow myself to lose focus, then those music notes go out the window, which in my case, it's business. And, and then that's not good. So every day you wake up and you have to be super laser focused on the outcomes. Yep. And I see that with music. It's just, it's, it's a beautiful thing, right? That, that is another great parallel because, um, you know, a lot of people imagine you go to a concert, you hear some amazing performance, could be a musician, a dancer, or, you know, whatever. And a lot of people think, wow, those people are just so talented as if they were just born that way, you know. What mm -hmm. they don't see, and same thing with athletes, right? What they don't see is that while, you know, to some extent there may be natural proclivities, these people who really master whatever it is, you know, that's their craft is years and years and years and thousands of hours of very monotonous practice, like you said, how do I play that note perfectly, exactly the way that I want it for the right length, at the right volume, at the right time? You're seeing, you know, 10,000 hours of practice coming to fruition in the performance. But the, the parallel to me and for anybody that, yeah, like you said, especially if it's like a solo entrepreneur, how am I going to get started with something? To become a professional musician, let's say, uh, I would say it generally would take 10 years from the time that you first touch the instrument if you practice for a matter of hours every day. And if you're, this is why people generally, you know, it's a good idea to have mentors or teachers or advisors because, okay, not only do I have to be consistent and dedicated over a long period of time, but somehow I have to figure out how do I know that the practice or the activities that I'm doing are directed at the outcome that I want? Sure. And that's very difficult. It's all in, it's in this, it's kind of in a blind spot because if you've never done it before, it's in the space of, well, I don't know what I don't know. So how do I get my advisors or my teachers to help me figure out if I do this every day for, you know, two hours a day, 10 years from now, I'm going to achieve this outcome probably, but that's such a long time horizon that it's very difficult for people to think on that sort of scale of, you know, what, you know, one, five, 10 years. And I think musicians have all gone through that experience. Anybody who started playing music at a young age and then who is now an adult and is a professional musician can look back and say, wow that was such a long horizon to get me to where I am now. And starting a business is just like that. Or, you know, it it, it's like, uh, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day and you're probably not going to have a multi-million dollar business in, you know, nine months or something like that. It's a long journey uh, for the majority of people. How do you deal with friends, family, <clears throat> especially family, but friends too, understanding that you do have to put that amount of time and you have both, you have both the music and you have, even though your music is, you're mostly leading the company there. I know you still play, um, sure. but in business, I find it that because you don't always see what a business is doing, especially if you're not a products business, if you're services like us, sure. my family can't always understand that it, it is a 24 seven cycle. Uh, if I leave opportunities on the tables, my competitors will get them. So sure. no matter if I have a team of 10 or a hundred, and I've had teams of hundreds of people, the question that I get from family and friends is like, well, you, you know, you must be doing so well. You can just take your eyes off the, off, off the machine and go enjoy it. And it doesn't really work that way because I've experienced the highs and the lows. Mm -hmm. And there's absolutely a correlation between me being there and making sure that it's moving forward. It's different if I'm investing in a business as just an investor, but if sure. I'm actually leading that vision, I have to be there. And I think in business, family and friends, I get this from a lot of entrepreneurs. 
especially from their wives or husbands. <laughs> and my wife understands because she's in a business with me. So she under, she really does see that I'm not just sitting around and reading blogs or whatever, right? I'm making sure. things happen. But um, unlike music, where you actually see the byproduct and it's fun and enjoyable, your family would be able to, in that case, go, oh, I see what you're doing. Even if you're a struggling artist or musician, but I see the like the byproduct. We're in business. The only byproduct that most people see is how big is your company, right? Do you have X amount of employees or is it, is it making millions? And are you growing your, your sort of wealth? And then if we see that, then I see a correlation because if they don't, typically you're just called a workaholic or a failing entrepreneur. And I get that a lot from, from, from different people. And I say, well, uh -huh. It's a matter of how you want to live your life, right? So talk to me about that. Like, do you do you struggle with that in any way on the, on the business side, being sort of uh, pinned as like, an, you're, you're a workaholic, Matt. That's all you do. Uh, so that's a good question. I mean, I will say that I, I feel very fortunate and very appreciative that my wife is extremely supportive <clears throat> and... She's just just very sweet and you know very nice with me. But also my you know my dad uh, is an entrepreneur and you know took a kind of similar path to now what I'm following. So he under, he totally gets it. You know. Um, so is he one so, of your mentors in, in the business side? Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, that's awesome. And that's part of the thing, which which is very fortunate uh, that I have you know, a great relationship with my dad and somebody that, you know, I've Trust. always been able to go yeah. to for advice. And, and uh, I, I also recognize how lucky that is because, you know, not everybody has that opportunity in, in a direct family member. Sure. Um, what I would say to the people that don't have that in a direct family member is um, you'd be surprised how many people are willing to help you if you ask in the right way especially people who are older and more successful, who are no longer just about, you know, people that have reached a certain age or level of success, you know, okay, well, they don't care about a few extra dollars one way or another. And there's lots of people like that who are willing to help. And, um, you know, yeah, mentor I've mentorship is great. Mentorship, right. right. I've got lots of other people too, that, you know, I would put in that category that are just older people that have walked the path, you know, before that, uh, that are helpful to me. But to answer your question about sort of, I mean, yes, I run into this sometimes because I don't feel a distinction for myself. I don't feel a distinction between work and not work because I just like the stuff. I just like everything that I'm doing. That's not to say I like it when I have to do something, you know, file some tedious papers with the state government or something like that. Yeah. It's not that I like the every single activity, but generally speaking, I really, really enjoy what I'm doing. So if I do it on a Monday or if I do it on a Saturday, doesn't make, I don't see any distinction. Uh, and I also sometimes will do something that most people would do on the weekends on a Monday, right? So uh, to me, it's just, there's, there's seven days right. and 24 hours a day and I'm trying to fill it up with uh, the most impactful, but also the most uh, sort of, uh, you know, as much as I can, the stuff that I get fulfillment from. And uh, sometimes people don't understand that, for example. And I know there's a lot of musicians are like this too. Why are you working on a holiday? Right. Weekends, for example. Nice. Or why are you working on a Sunday? Yeah. Um, you know, but generally, I, I feel lucky that my wife and my family is very supportive. But yeah, it's definitely something that it, it's a different mindset compared to maybe the more common, uh, you know, this work, work life balance thing that people talk about, which I'm totally, I can talk about that because, uh, I just have a little bit of a different interpretation of what that means, but, um, yeah, I, well, I don't, well, I don't actually, see a distinction between the week weekdays and the weekends. Me, me neither. And I agree with you. It's 365. I have goals that I want to reach. Some yeah. I will reach earlier than later. And that that's what it's about in the journey there. But I'm glad you brought up the work life balance thing, because we're seeing a shift, right? That hybrid model that employees sure. who are leaving the job market because employers are saying, hey, 
No, actually, I was just at a chamber of commerce event yesterday, not an event, it was a meeting for a committee. And we had this conversation about some really large headquarter, like corporations that are in South Florida who are saying, by Labor Day, the, all those employees need to come back. They right. need to come back to the office. And what I'm hearing, we just hired four new people. And what I'm hearing is people want the hybrid and or yep. fully remote. So, yep. but we were also talking about the fact that a lot of people have been getting unemployment. And so they feel like they have a choice now to do that. And once that goes away, then they're going to sort of come back to, okay, I, I got to go in and work. But I think the, the most recent study they did in uh, it was Iceland. They took 24, 2,500 public works employees, right? And they gave them four day work weeks. And I, I don't remember if it was for six months or a year, it was an extended period of time, but four day work weeks. What they found was that the performance was better overall. They were, of course, happier. And then the one thing that had to happen when these um, uh, unions went in and worked with the government to put this in place was the pay couldn't change, right? They couldn't be paid mm -hmm. less for working 36 hours. So mm -hmm. it's different than companies here who may do four 10 hour days in the summer, the seasonal businesses. That's not it at all. This was basically nine to four, four days a week. So 35, mm -hmm. 36 hours. And they found that people were overall happier. And you're talking about a pretty large study, 2,500 people. Yeah, they were happier. They were paid the same and the performance was great. So it, is this going to be a huge shift here in the U.S.? I don't know, because I feel like the United States is the power that it is, is because we are so competitive in nature. And sure. I think there are people who want to reach the moon, reach for the sure. moon. And there are people yeah. who don't. But um, talk, talk to me about that work life balance, because I know your team is mostly virtual, right? Yeah. We're for both companies. It's a hundred percent virtual, um, and I've got people all over the place. And it's really, I love it because we all come together. I'll tell you about the structure that we've put in place to uh, have everybody coming together at certain times and maintain this kind of, you know, structure of accountability and making sure people are doing what they're supposed to be doing in a remote environment. Um, you know, in terms of, I, I don't know, maybe. I, I'll, I'll be diplomatic and, and not, I, I'm, I don't know if I have an opinion fully formed about the, like the study you're talking about with the four day versus the five day work week. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, what I will say though, is I think there is a lot, a lot that people can uh, learn and practice and put into place in terms of time management skills in order to achieve uh, I think what people are referring to as the work-life balance, um, in my opinion, a lot of it is about developing structures and skills for managing your time and your communication. So, for example, uh, if somebody thinks work-life balance means I've got an appointment to have dinner with my wife or my family at, you know, whatever, six o'clock on a Tuesday, and I'm upset with my job because... I get overloaded with stuff at the end of the day and then I have to skip my dinner. Like, I think, you know, stuff like this that bothers people, right? Um, one of the things that I do to a pretty extreme extent and which I've encouraged everybody at both of my companies to do and people that have put this in place, it's funny because there are people that have put this in place in their work time and now call me back and say, oh my God, I'm doing it on the weekends too. And I'm, it's so much better. I'm very particular with my calendar. Okay. And I encourage people to do this. It's like, okay, I will put stuff on my calendar that most people would think is totally absurd. Like I will put, you know, take out the trash at 7.55 on a Tuesday. I'll put anything on my calendar. <laughs> and I make it kind of a game, right? Like, if it's on my calendar, it's what I'm doing. And if it's what I'm doing, it's on my calendar. And it's kind of a game. And so I'll put, take a nap. If I know, I, I mean, there's all this stuff. I'll put, if I'm going to go out and, you know, have lunch, whether it's for business or personal, whatever. I'll make sure. Do I have enough time to get there, not be in a rush, get back, do what I have to do? 
And if you really look at time that way, I think people will find that they have a tremendous amount more time than they give themselves credit for by really looking at it and considering how do I plan out my schedule? Because there really is a lot of time in the week. And I think, um, you know, a lot of it is people not managing their to-do list in the most you know, effective way or people not giving themselves the proper amount of time that they need to do something. Um, and then what goes along with that is if you say you're going to be out at five because you've got to drive 30 minutes to get to a dinner at six and you want to be there half an hour early so you're not stressed, great. If your boss calls you at 4.45 and says, oh, my God, I, you have to say the next time that I will be available to accommodate your request is X and not throw your whole thing for a loop. That's very challenging for people to do. But both the person who's doing it and, believe it or not, your boss, if you're coming at it from the employee perspective, will appreciate it as long as you actually do what you said you were going to do. So if you say, hey, boss, I can't do it right now. The next time I'm available to do it is at 10 o'clock when I come home or it's tomorrow morning at 1130 a.m., whatever. And then you actually do it exactly at the time that you said you were going to do it. You develop this great trust with the other person. And you've successfully managed your time such that you can do the work and the personal stuff without getting yourself overwhelmed. So that's what I, I do. And I see it's working for people that I tell, I tell people about this and it works. Yeah, no, and I agree with you, you know, it, and I always think of it that way. But when I talk to these larger companies, you know, they just flat out say like, it, I'm not going to allow right a thousand or five thousand employees to dictate their calendars this is yep. what it is i own them from here to here i'm not going to have yep. hr or managers worrying about that so to that i say for the other side the people who are you know the employees and frustrated i do a lot of mentoring at uh, different universities students who are just coming out and they'll ask actually i have a, a handful of interns right now one from FSU and a couple of others. And I try to give them, you know, tips and advice. And I say, like, you have to decide early on, you know, if you, because so many of the millennials, the younger millennials and Gen Z, they are, you know, they really want to change the world. They want to own their own business. So I try to paint the pros and cons of both. And even the pros of working for, you know, big corporation versus a small business, there's pros and cons. But I say, ultimately, the only way that you're going to really control your time is if you become the top person. It doesn't yeah, have to be exactly. your own business. And if it's a corporation, then you have to climb that corporate ladder. It might take you 10, 15, yep. 20 years. I yep. don't know. And ultimately, even if you're an entrepreneur and you own multiple businesses, you're the one that's signing all the checks. At the yep. end of the day, your clients are your boss. So you yep. have to decide still, and I tell them, I have to decide what type of clients I bring on because I'm not like most agencies that I just take on anyone expecting that my work, my, my team is going to work 24 seven. So I sure. can't take on those clients, but I do take on clients that value family yeah. first and know that yeah, no, yeah. they can't, can't call an employee yet. Like exactly. to your, to your point at 6 PM on a Tuesday and say, Alex, tell them to stay because sure. I'm not on board with that. But I also yeah. recognize the challenges of growing um, and, and, and sort of allowing uh, the, the, the environment to be a little bit more democratic, right? Yep. Well, and, and your point about control over your own time, to me, that's the number one reason why I chose to take the path that I'm on, as opposed to what the vast majority of my classmates from business school, for example, you know, want to work at these impressive big corporations and go up the corporate ladder. And that obviously, like you said, has its own advantages Perks. and disadvantages, yeah. right? But I would say that, you know, while in the very long term, just like this journey of becoming a professional musician, right? In the very long term, we have the potential to make very high income or or sell our business and all of that's very exciting right but i would say along the way 
control over freedom over your own time to me is the most important is personally the most important and satisfying thing and the reason why I am going on this path that I'm on um there may be other people for whom that's not as important and so they want to take advantage of of other you know perks at a big corporation or something like that but but to me um I don't care if I have to work on a Saturday sometimes I'll go out and you know I'm playing golf on a Tuesday wow I'm so happy that I made this decision because I you know whatever I organize my schedule that's right. in such a way that um you know if I have things to do I can move them around the way that I want and I and like you said as a young person the only way to accomplish that is having your own business I understand that there's you know you're right if you're the top person at a big company maybe you have more freedom of your time but um yeah I, I think it's it's a it's an interesting sort of point for people if they're coming out of school to consider okay most people are talking only about salary 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 how much money am i going to make but there's these other factors which shouldn't be taken for granted yeah. you know in in people deciding what path they want to walk down yeah it could change your life dramatically early on so yep. matt let's let's switch gears to the wiggler group because i'm excited to talk shop about lead generation marketing sales and customer service and sure. really primarily we're going to touch on the sales and sort of customer service. Why? Because you and I have talked a few times about the fact that my company, Predict, they, you know, we do the lead gen part. We drive traffic to websites. We drive calls sure. to sales teams. But what they do beyond generating those leads and growing their SEO visibility, all of that sure. is not up to me, right? And so whether they bring somebody in to train, whether they have seasoned managers, it, it can make or break the ROI in the marketing and lead gen yeah. side. So talk to me about you, what you guys do and, and how you go about it. Sure. And so this is very interesting because we, um, here's, here's what I've seen about uh, sort of the awareness, lead generation, sales funnel, you know, the, it, it's all relatively analogous across the different businesses, but depending on some different variables, I see that the approach, uh, you know, there's some, uh, some companies that our approach I feel is the right fit. There's some companies that's not the right fit. And, and, you know, it's an interesting thing to consider. So um, in our case, when we find that there's a client that is selling something business to business, relatively high ticket sort of complex you know generally if the deal is worth less than 25 30,000 at a minimum it's not going to work for us and I'll explain why and we've got clients that have deal sizes in the millions that are very complex to try to get into a big enterprise and do you know do what they need to do um and the thing that we do which I think it's very common sense, but it's not on the minds of a lot of business owners, including the people that we reach out to that are like, wow, I never even thought about it this way. It's so simple. A lot of our clients have a target market of 500, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, you know, of all of the 400 million people in the United States, right? We've got clients where there are 2,000 people in the whole country that need to know about their service. If you spend the money or the time to advertise to people who are not in that 2000, you may be building awareness of your brand if, if that's important to you, right? But you're not getting the message right in front of the decision maker, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so we've got all these projects, including for ourselves to a great extent, where the target market is so niche, so defined, that what we do is we say, for that type of project, you may not need lead generation in the typical way that people think about it. We're gonna go out and research and hand pick everyone on that list of 2000. We're gonna find them. We're gonna put them into the top of our funnel. 
And then we're going to call them and email them and follow up with them and all of that. So that eventually over a long period of time, the funnel starts to take shape and you have consistent flow of mm -hmm. opportunities. So just, I'll give you a real example of this. So uh, this is the same process that we've been doing for years on my first business, on the entertainment business for the hotels. So there's about a thousand ish hotels in our target market, right? Four or five star hotels. They got to be relatively big. They got to have restaurants and bars, you know, all around the country. We've got them defined and I have people reaching out and first building awareness among our decision makers so that, you know, and, and I think what a lot of people don't realize is that it takes a lot more than one, two or three emails or phone calls to build awareness. Mm -hmm. um, there's people that I look in a CRM and one of us from my company has had a live conversation with them over the phone or over video two, three, four times. And then we call back and they say, I don't remember you guys. Who? You'd be surprised how much follow-up it takes before you really have sure. like, you know, the awareness, like everybody knows Coca-Cola. Well, you know, that didn't happen in six months, right? Build the awareness, start to reach out to them and follow up with them at the time that they are ready to buy and then move them on to the next stage, which is, you know, whatever each, each company has their own complexity does it require you know a discovery meeting and then a follow-up yeah, and then a, a demo whatever right the demo whatever but so that's the way that we conceptualize it for those clients that have that really targeted kind of niche there and what happens is over a long period of time you know like a year or two years you start to build this amazing pipeline of people that are aware we understand what's important to them because we're actually having conversations. We understand what's going on with them in the business, other vendors, other competitors that we didn't know existed, pain points that we didn't really know what was important to them. And we get all this feedback and then eventually it crosses over and the tide starts to flow in the direction we want, which is, yeah, you guys have been reaching out to me for nine months. I'm ready. Let's do it. Or, you know, and, and so that's sort of what we do for ourselves and on behalf of all of our clients. Um, it is not easy and it is not quick, but it really works if you build the foundation and do it consistently, like we were talking about before, over a long period of time. I love it. What kind of industries work really well? I know the, the ticket size matters for you guys, obviously, because for you to be able to invest that kind of money, they can't be selling a $200 product or right, service. Exactly. So we have, um, we have a bunch of media and advertising agencies mm -hmm. that uh, have, you know, they're going after big budgets, you know, it could be multi-million dollar advertising budgets that they're trying to manage and you know tend to have really long client retention you know i mean we've got these kind of you know so we've got some more old-fashioned out-of-home advertising agencies that uh you know they've they've got 20-year client retention it's just amazing right so that's really well aligned because we define our target markets and then they know that even if they convert, even if it takes a year, even if it takes two years, they only need to get one new customer out of our relationship to get sure. a phenomenal return on investment. Now, ho hopefully we're going to do a lot better than that, but you know, that's really well aligned because it's big deals, slow and steady, consistency over a long period of time. We also have uh, enterprise software clients that just have you know larger deal sizes or they're complex and you know, they're trying to work their way into these big organizations and figure out who the decision makers are and that sort of process. And that's working well. And then we also have people that are more in the, you know, we've done a number of projects where sometimes more of a startup or it's venture capital funded, or, you know, there's a lot of people that have a hypothesis about the solution or the pain point that they're resolving. 
mm-hmm. but they haven't talked to quite enough decision makers in that target industry to be 100% certain that these are the words that I need to say to these people to resolve exactly the pain point, the way that they think about it and, and have that puzzle piece fit in just right. And so we've got projects where we're um, basically still doing, I mean, we're booking meetings and getting some potential deals into play, but at the same time, we're sort of doing market research for people where we deliver these insights and this feedback from actually having conversations with the decision makers. And that allows people to iterate and improve their marketing message or improve the way that they talk about how their solution resolves the pain point. And so there's, you know, that's sort of the range of of what we're seeing right right now. And what about um, when you guys are reaching out, Matt, you know, there's so many channels of communication. When you're reaching out, what's more effective? Is it to open the door? When I say open the door, I mean, they actually responded. Yeah. It, it, sometimes not favorable, which is okay. But I just exactly. mean they, they actually responded. Is it electronically or via phone call? Which yeah. are you seeing the best results? It depends a little bit by industry, Um, the types of industries where people are always in the office or in the building, they're easy to reach on the phone. But Mm -hmm. the last year has been very challenging with people working from home and we can't get forwarded to them. We call people cell phones, but you know, it's, it's challenging to get people to pick up the phone. Mm -hmm. Um, We've seen that we get a lot of our, replies or or a sense of whether people are engaged through email interaction Mm -hmm. but we get a lot of our extremely valuable insight and feedback through somebody either replying to an email and saying tell me more or they they come back with a question and then we pick up the phone and follow up. And now it's easier to get them to answer because we know that they're engaged, right? And then we can pick it up over the phone in terms of a more detailed conversation. Um, But, you know, we, so I would say, yeah, I would say it's a lot of the email metrics that drives us understanding who's more likely to respond to us. Uh, If they reply to the email, then that's the best because they've already engaged. But if they're clicking on the link to the website, if they're, you know, you can kind of tell if they're really, you know, if we've sent them six follow-up emails and they've gone to the website every time, mm-hmm. then my uh, team knows, okay, I better pick up the phone and call that person as a top priority because that person must have some level of engagement. And so it's it's a combination, but I would say it is, quite challenging to get people to pick up the phone on the first try. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I've ran a lot of those. I mean, for, for years, for decades, really, I've never stopped doing cold calling, right? Myself and my team included. I'm not shy. We we use a little software called uh, call uh, just call.io. So it's cloud and everybody has a user account on their phone Right. and it records everything and you score the leads. It's really great. And, uh, I don't mind picking up and doing 10, 15 calls just to see what has changed in the last 10, 20 years. I've been doing it since 99, right? So I look at it not much has changed. There's a certain number of calls that you have to make in order for a certain number of people to pick up. Yep. Your script, that's a whole other thing, right? You have to have people who really understand how to build rapport, open doors, yeah, get exactly. through the so that's that also never changes, you know. But I do see that a combination of reaching out to people via uh, uh, their email versus direct messaging them on LinkedIn versus direct messaging them here or there, it's all over the place, right? Like, hey, yeah. I heard you on a clubhouse room and I really right. enjoyed what you said a message like that goes way further than just yes. reaching out and saying, Hey, I'm trying to connect with you. Well, so obviously- now you're talking about something, right? Which is what the, the, the real thing that improves the connection and response rate is not some tricky thing about, you know, here's my free ebook. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's, nobody it's, cares. Not, it's not that nobody cares. And it's not, 
AI, whatever, at least not from what I can no. tell. I know there's a lot of stuff out there that they use these fancy words to confuse no. the people into thinking that it's so great. But I think what really improves the connection rate is when the person that's about to reach out actually sits there and thinks for a minute about who is this person? What background information or possible connection can I find so that I'm not just some other person pitching something? And if I can find some way to tie it in, and this is, for example, one of the things that all of my people on my team, we call them outreach specialists, are, are uh, you could think of them as business development mm -hmm. reps or whatever, but the, my team of people that is calling on behalf of the clients. They reach out to our clients when they have an interesting prospect and they'll say, do you have any background information or familiarity or friend of a friend, or you've got a client, you know, they used to work at your client. I mean, there's all these different ways that we can strategize about an individual prospect, which, you know, that is a very quality over quantity approach where you don't have to make a thousand calls necessarily. If you make 10 calls or a hundred calls, but each one of them is just like a bullseye and yeah. you actually have something of value or something. I don't mean an ebook of value. I no. just mean something like, you know, some connection that you can establish. The reply, the response rate is very high on that sort of approach. Yeah. The thing that works has always worked for us is approaching it that way from business development. It's really to customize and there's no better way than trying to search the internet, search their website, their press yeah. room, and look at what, what's important to them. Because if I'm putting in my media exactly. or press page, something important about a new product, or I just raised X, Y, Z. Yeah. That lends itself to something so much better than, exactly. you know, I have some inbound marketing content for you here, or, you know, yeah, just exactly. really flat out selling you. And I try to explain that to clients, you know, and um, I think all, a lot of companies, small businesses have this idea, especially if they're still have, seeing success in the growth of their business, because they have 80% of their revenue coming from 20% of the customers, which is right. a problem, but it's okay. But they're, they're, they're thinking that, hey, you know, AI, like you said, marketing automation, retargeting ads, like that's all going to do the trick. And it's not, I know, listen, for us, for 10 yeah. plus years, the way we grew was going to conferences, meeting people face to face, and then sure. following up long sales cycle. And, and I bet it didn't happen after just your first trip to your first oh. conference. Oh, gosh, it, it, no. th this is the thing that I always tell yeah. clients about. And there's a wide, I'm sure that <laughs> I'm sure you'll appreciate this. There's such a wide range of understanding among business owners or, or whoever our client is, there's a wide range of understanding about just how much persistence over a long period of time this takes to really produce the result. It's like, you know, I, I'm in downtown Miami. They're building this giant skyscraper across the way from me. And, I, and I've seen, I've lived, in, I've lived down here for a number of years and I've seen it from when this was just a grass lot and now it's like 70 stories up in the air. They're wow. almost going to top it off, right? Years. And, and, and from one day to the next day, you can't see progress. From one yeah. week to the next week, you can't see progress. It's like trying to look at a clock and watch the hour hand move, and you can't see it. It's like but learning you know, the notes the notes of a like, song, right? Like for, because this is the thing, right? It's, it's time horizon. And I learned this from music, and now I see it's so important for any large project. And, and this is what I'm, I'm sharing this with, you know, everyone, because it's so important is, are we doing the right activity every day? Yeah. And is it on track to eventually top off an 80 story skyscraper, but it's not going to happen in a month no. because it's like you said, if you go to these conferences every year for 10 years, you start to see people that you saw last year and you start to people recognize you and you got the oh. relationships going. Right. But it didn't happen. Just I bought one ticket to one conference and yeah. I didn't get any clients. So I gave up, That's you right. know, it, it takes a lot of patience and persistence. Yeah. Patience, persistence. I love that. So we're going to end it with being patient and persistent. 
to be able to grow and see success and and learn from the failures, right? Reflect on those failures and optimize accordingly, which I think is so important. I certainly do that. Matt, how can our listeners find you? What's the best way for them to connect with you, learn about your, your different uh, business ventures? Sure. So I'm very active on LinkedIn. So uh, obviously feel free to connect with me there. And then, um, you know, I've got the Wiggler Group uh, website is wigglergroup.com. The MHW Live Music website is mhwlivemusic.com. I have my music and also all kinds of other general stuff on mattwiggler.com. So it's very easy to find me, including contact information if you go to any of those places. Well, I'll add um, the links to the show notes and on the blog, we always do a blog post. Um, but yeah, I encourage anybody to look at your website. I really enjoyed watching the videos of you playing the piano. You have such a great voice Thank as you. well. Yeah, so I appreciate um, it. like very, very Michael Bublé ish. I'm sure people have told you that in the past, but <laughs> sure. yeah. Thank you. I really enjoyed the uh, conversation today, Matt. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Alex. I really appreciate it. All right. That's it for the dadpreneur podcast with Alex Oliveira. Like what you heard? Leave us a review. If you have questions, email us at listener at dadpreneur.co. You may also visit dadpreneur.co for free resources.